Hey guys, welcome to Leadership Lessons from Titus. Titus was a leader that Paul had raised up, and we learned last week that he had actually accompanied Paul on his trip to Jerusalem in Acts 15 as an example of a Gentile convert, and he was uncircumcised. He was one of the brothers who was not part of the Jewish community that got engrafted through the New Covenant, through Jesus. And on this island of Crete, which is about 3,200 and some square miles, was more than one congregation. And Paul had attempted to plant churches there, and as was his style, he would go to the Jews first and minister to them until they ran him off, and then he would leave with a nucleus of people <laughs> and go to the Gentiles and worship on a river bank or in somebody's house somewhere and be there for a season and then leave and then come back later and raise up leaders. So he would leave them without anybody officially in charge. I'm sorry he had it nailed down where they were going to meet and things like that, but no one long-term was in charge when he first started the church. And I guess he had learned, or the Lord had led him, that if you make people leaders too quick, it goes to their head. In fact, in one of his letters he wrote, don't lay hands on anyone suddenly. Don't ordain a novice lest he be puffed up and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Another one of his letters, he told the church, I hear that there's divisions among you. I believe this is true, and of course I know it has to be. That way we can find out who the leaders are. Let's dive in where we started last week. He introduces himself. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth, which is according to godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began, but has in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God our Savior. To Titus, my son, in our common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Last week we got into why Paul would begin his documents, his letters, his books with these long salutations and even self-introductions. Vince helped center us up by saying, hey, he's saying things about the gospel here. <laughs> he's not just introducing himself. But if he hadn't introduced himself, maybe his letters wouldn't have been included in the canon. I last week kind of got a taste of what it would be like to get something in the mail without any kind of introduction, I got a book in the mail entitled Grace for the World in an envelope, postmarked Fort Worth, but no return address from a total stranger who left a note, Alan, I would like to know what you think of this, LT. And it's a book that he's written. And so I open the book. He thanks people for reading it. Please send comments to his email address, but there's nothing about him. You know, I like to know, does he love Jesus? Uh, you know, is he a believer in the gospel, or is this some off-the-wall thing before I dive in? I mean, it's not like a huge book, but, you know, send somebody a book without any kind of introduction to who you are as a writer. I think some people won't read it. In fact, I'm tempted not to. In fact, I'm kind of annoyed by it. And so Paul, I think, was walking in wisdom here. So I think there's some credibility to saying who you are. He wasn't bragging. He was just giving his credentials, as it were. No, no the, the Jews had the Torah, but the Gentiles basically had nothing that was written. Texas or, or other than just these letters that they've received or been sent to by well, Paul. Well, because there was Jewish members in their midst, because that's where the churches would start, the Jews had these synagogues all throughout the Roman Empire where they were allowed to worship, and Caesar's governments, the Roman government, wouldn't persecute them. And so Paul would somewhat subversive go in there and begin to reason with them and preach Jesus. And, and he would win some converts. That way they would... That, that's the reason they just kicked him out, because they didn't want to lose any more members. 
to believing in Jesus as the Messiah. And so they had the scriptures. They had a knowledge of the Torah. And they could preach Jesus from the Old Testament. That's what the book of Hebrews has a lot of in it. Uh, Christ being preached from the Old Testament. But there was no certain set of scriptures. Like, uh, they didn't... I mean, it wasn't until the 4th century when the, when talk of canonizing the scriptures uh, between church leaders... Yeah. I think Constantine had a hand in bringing them together, and they brought the documents that had helped them, and and they debated the issue and actually had some fights over it. I think some people you know, may really got hurt in the deal, uh, hammering out what was inspired and what wasn't inspired. And uh, it's appealing to some people to want to read the lost books of the Bible. And when you read them, there's some off-the-wall stuff in there, and you find out why they threw them out, things they believed about women and things they even believed about Jesus. Um, anyway, so... I don't know if he meant it or not, but <clears throat> uh, written stuff to and about the Gentiles apart from, and there's probably a good reason for that, most of the educated people in these areas are educated in the synagogue and only the boys. And so Gentiles might worship, you know, a lamppost or something. They didn't have any yeah, was, written instructions yeah. about... That's what I'm just re reflecting on. You know, I mean, how easy would it be to fall away with, with yeah. you know, I would, people fall away we have a Bible sitting in front of us that we can refer to and they don't get yeah. it. They don't yeah, you know, so it's true. way back then, they they definitely assembled themselves together often, and there was discipling going on and teaching, and, and uh, you know there was traditions being passed down that were good. Yes, Tom. You know, the synagogue is, is a gathering place. It wasn't just a church, and they it was used virtually every day of the year, uh, and every day of the week. But when you went into those old century towns. You would walk down the streets and you would pass multitudes of temples to Apollo, to Jupiter, to all the Roman gods, all the Greek gods, you know, all the Parthenon of any other religion that the Romans had conquered that they just incorporated into their official Roman Empire because mm. they didn't discern between them. They could care less what you worship as long as it didn't disrupt their, them, <coughs> their rule, and taxes. their taxes. You know, that was it. You, you, know, you, you could go over here and worship a stump. And in Greece, I mean, Paul wrote about it. In Greece, when he went to Greece, he went and he says, this temple that you have with all these hundreds of gods around town, you have one that has nothing. It says to the no unknown man. God, in case we miss somebody. You know? <laughs> That's the one. You've missed him. He, there is no image of him. Yeah. And I'm here to tell you about him. Yeah. You know, so that, it, it was easy to be subverted. And, you know, a lot of the temples had prostitutes, and, you know, uh, that was it's, not uncommon. In fact, you know, here in a second, we get to the point of, you know, it was the, the, the wiles of the flesh were common in everyday culture there. So you could understand a little bit why the Judaizers wanted the Gentile believers to be circumcised and begin to keep in the law of Moses. Because there was no New Covenant scriptures per se. There was just these apostles running around that Jesus had discipled, and they were writing things, and they were declaring things and teaching things. And so this official document carved out of the experience in Acts 15 was so powerful, asking them to only do four things as Gentile believers, to abstain from idolatry, you know, stay out of all those other temples, abstain from fornication, which was sexual sin of all kinds outside of marriage between a husband and a wife. Right. Abstain from things strangled and from drinking blood. And, of course, we know that Christ told them to go and make disciples and teach them to observe everything he commanded. So they had records of the things Jesus commanded, you know, love your enemies. So when they would, and, and also him him reading Isaiah 61, this is what I'm about. And so they could read Isaiah 51, 61 and say, hey, guys, this is our assignment. This is what Jesus came to begin. And, yeah, so it was, it was, um, 
even though we have scriptures today, and you mentioned how often people neglect the scriptures, they didn't have scriptures, but yet they were able to follow the Lord too. And so it's not a legalistic thing like I must read the scriptures an hour a day or I'm going to fall away. But this is an anchor to us that we need to value. And it seems like every generation starts questioning the canonizing of the scriptures. And we got to dig through all that again to see if they did the right thing, like we think they were morons. And uh, and we're kind of there again, I think, with the emergent type churches that are springing up, questioning and encouraging people to pick and choose from the New Testament. But does that help, or was this relating? Well, yeah, yeah. It's just the difficulty of of how Christianity grew from yeah. from that kind of a chaotic. Word of, word of mouth and my experience. Well, yes, yeah, because and, and the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit. We've got so much. Yeah. We got so much Satan worship and witchcraft mixed into Christianity throughout the world, and, and from you know Papua New Guinea to Islam in Nigeria. And, yeah. And, yeah. You got, you got to remember these these uh, disciples. I'm so turned. It, it wasn't a TV they were looking at. It wasn't uh, a, a large uh, amphitheater with somebody down there in a video screen. It wasn't even... These people were preaching face to face. And you probably know, in our generation, I'm about to do my hand this, but you can grow up standing and talk to a man for a few minutes and, and feel the dedication his faith, his truthfulness, and that, like this. And it was all brought to people like this. I've all, I've all. And it was, it seemed like to me, it was a simpler time to convert. But, in a, you know, in a group, I mean, one person, you go, what? No, yeah. that's not what he said. <laughs> no, or, or they, they come away with such a... a well, you, well, what we're about to see here was they had that kind of thing going on then, too. Um, yeah. What people do without the scriptures, they do with the scriptures. You know, no scriptures to twist, well, you come up with stuff. Scriptures to twist, you come up with stuff. And so I think uh, the culture was simpler, and I think we, we see this in the third world. I mean, they're in the streets all the time visiting with people and and uh, so this meeting together was real important. They they didn't have much of, in terms of Holy Scripture, but they had the Holy Spirit and they had the Holy People. And some people want the Holy Spirit, they want the Holy Scripture, but they don't want much to do with the Holy People. And that's not how you wouldn't have survived as a Christian in the first century with that. Um, let's look at his assignment. He starts right off with leadership. Is he uh, not concerned about people that aren't leaders? No, it's just... Uh, leaders are called to serve people that aren't so that they, too, will become leaders. And so he's starting at the right place. He said, for this reason, verse 5, for this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. So they had... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> they had they had obviously had conversations, and Paul had spoken to him about the villages. I mean, I think at one point there may have been a hundred hundred towns on this island. I don't know that they all had churches yet, but uh, there was more than one place that had it, and so they had had a conversation about that. And so Paul's telling them to to set in order the things that are lacking. I mean, if there's somebody teaching something incorrect, you've got to correct that. Um. And appoint elders in every city. So every community needed leaders. Uh, the word elder that he used in the Greek language is the word presbyteros. Sometimes in English it's transliterated presbyter. That's where we get the word Presbyterian from. Um, they identify themselves by being their churches being governed by elders. Uh, and this word speaks of a person's character, his character. And then notice um, he's going to use the word bishop 
interchangeably with the word elder. And the word bishop means overseer. And the Greek word for bishop is epi, which is over, seer, or the person that sees the big picture. Uh, epic is a big story or a big movie, so epi or big scopos. Episcopos, the big seer or the overseer. That's where we get the word episcopal, uh, governed by bishops. Now, somewhere over church history, things got a little jacked up, as, they, as we know they can, and elders became a separate office from bishop. And that's not the case here in this text. Uh, bishop speaks of the function, and elder speaks of the maturity. Uh, it can mean someone older or someone mature, presbyter. Um, so his maturity or his character qualifies him for his function, overseeing. And so first of all, he's talking about the character and then we'll get into the function. <laughs> Appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. If a man is blameless, uh, the word blameless, I, I like to liken to the word Teflon. Uh, the world is full of people that want to stick blame on you. They want to accuse you. They want to lie about you. They want to slander you. But if you live in such a way, above reproach, uh, not flirting with the devil or, or being caught in compromising positions, um, it won't stick. And it can test you. I mean, you may, you may want to go on a rampage defending yourself. But if you hold your integrity, it will not stick. Um, we overcome the accuser of the brethren by the blood of the Lamb, loving not our, I mean, uh, by the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, loving not our lives even to death. So if somebody accuses us to the point it's going to kill us, we don't love our lives. We hold to his life. And so... An elder is someone who's to be like Teflon, someone that to whom an accusation won't stick. His integrity speaks for him. The husband of one wife. Um, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination. Um, the old King James says, uh, not accused of riot or unruly. The word riot actually can mean unsaved. So it's important that the leader's children want to follow the Lord. Um, why? Well, everything starts at home. And while we are all called to serve the Lord, we're called to serve Him at home first. And so, uh, if a man's able to be an elder at home, then he can be an elder of the house. And so it's it's the kind of man he's to look for because he's got multiple groups to put leaders in. For a bishop or an overseer must be blameless. There that is again, a steward of God. Now what is a steward? A steward is someone that's called to take care of something that doesn't belong to him. Um, if you're a pastor of a church, that's not your church. You're a steward of the church. It's the Lord's church. Um, I know many times we identify a congregation by the pastor's name, you know, uh, Barry Tubbs Church or Glenn Ward's church. But, but biblically, biblically uh, those men know it's not their church. It's the Lord's church, and we're called to be stewards of that. The NASB keeps using above reproach, the phrase. Yes. Where are we talking? For blameless. Yeah, well, yes. I think it's a better way to say it. Above uh, reproach, approach. right. Right. Um, not self-willed. It's, it's not about uh, leading a church or serving a church. It's not about your ambitions being met. I mean, you know, you want to have vision, but you want that vision to be from the Lord. Uh, not quick-tempered. And if you're quick to flow up, fly off the hammer, uh, and you're a church leader, people won't trust you. That's not a good example. Uh, not given to wine. 
our call could be a problem. Some people are so given to wine, it's a major investment in their life. I mean, they spend thousands on it. And uh, lives are wrecked by that. And um, in talking about the problem of eating uh, kosher meat versus Gentiles eating pork, Paul talked about not wanting to cause a brother to stumble. If it causes a person to sin, then we shouldn't eat meat for the rest of our life, if that's the case. And that may seem extreme to us, eating meat, but it's very easily easy to understand about drinking. And you can cause a guy to lose his sobriety by tempting him with a glass of something. And um, they could go on and go on a rant, or go on a binge and wreck their life. And, and wine was prevalent drink of the day. It wasn't right. like today where it was controlled. It was it was the right. drink. It right. was the Coca Cola of the day. Right. And the water. But the other part is is that they many of the other temples slaughtered animals as sacrifice. And yeah, that doesn't go over well with the Jews. It can create problems in and of itself there, so. Yeah, yeah, meat. animals offered to idols, right. Yeah. Right, and uh, that letter from Acts 15 talks about it, strangled meats and blood, not related to idolatry. Um, so, you know, I think historically they drank wine. I mean, that was their beverage. The water was often be contaminated but not to the point of drunkenness because that would be sinful. So they couldn't be alcoholics and be a leader. Not violent. So beyond just getting angry, I think the old King James says not a striker. Can't be quick to go to Fifth City. Yeah. Uh, Not greedy for money. Um... The old King James says, "Filthy, filthy lucre." Not, not. It's, it's like ill-gotten gain. Shorted. Hmm. Shorted gain. Yes. Um, the pastor of the largest church in Europe. I mean, this is a heartbreaking story. He's in court right now, defending himself. I don't know if he's guilty or not, but there was a pyramid scheme that went off in his church. This is in Ukraine, in Kiev, Ukraine. People were losing their houses from this thing, all kinds of things. And because he, he's the leader of the congregation, the one that planted it, he's in court defending himself. And if he in any way gave credence to this thing, hoping to benefit from it, um, he's going down. And it may not have been for himself, but if your church does well, it really is for yourself. You know, um, buildings can get churches in trouble. And a preacher can say, it wasn't for me, it was for the building. But if your church is exploding and you have an awesome building and you've committed a crime for that building, you, you're shirking something going on here. A great building makes you look great as a leader. And so you just have to be careful. You've got to walk in wisdom. That's why I believe in the plurality of elders. Amen. Notice he said... He did not say, appoint an elder in every city. Appoint elders in every city. He didn't say how many elders in every city. And he didn't say who would be an elder. He just told the kind of man to appoint an elder. So hopefully each city had more than one of these kind of men. Hopefully the whole church was like this. I mean, these are values we should all want to hold. But out of this pool of people of integrity... Point some to be leaders, overseers, men who are elders who are able to be bishops, function as bishops. Good thing you didn't visit Sodom. Huh? Good thing you didn't visit Sodom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught. So someone who's solid in their understanding, that he may be able, by sound doctrine or sound teaching, both to exhort and convict those who contradict. 
So just like in our day with the scriptures and their day without the scriptures, there's people coming up with all kinds of weird teachings. And so this person not only should be a person of integrity, but a person who's able to communicate. He's able to teach. That's what sound doctrine is, sound teaching. And he's able to exhort. That's to challenge people to call them higher, call them out, and convict or to convince those who contradict. What does another translation say there for verse 9? Uh, holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able both to exhort and sound the doctrine and to refute those who contradict. Refute those who contradict. All right. So he's able to... Uh, this is why he can't be quick-tempered. Have you ever been in a spiritual debate or a biblical debate with someone and you suddenly tempers flare? Yeah. Yeah, sometimes it's my sometimes it might be your own. That doesn't give credence to your argument. You know, uh, substituting facts for volume doesn't convince anybody. You want not to win arguments, but you want to persuade people to believe properly. Well, it's got to be a debate, not an argument. Because <laughs> argument. Yeah. Some, somebody is going to yeah flare to an extreme that <laughs> yeah causes the other one to walk out or storm out. You know? Storm out or you know. keep it in a debate format. And sometimes you could you know things do go that way. You say, can we talk again tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> Calm down, pray, seek the Lord. Now he's fixing to tell why the reason for verse nine really. Why hold fast the faithful word as you've been taught and be able to teach by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict or refute those who contradict? Verse 10, for there are many insubordinate or rebellious, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. <laughs> Jews, people that had the Torah. Now, keep in mind, they're living in a unique time of history. The, the churches are born out of, out of synagogues. So there's Jewish members, and there's synagogues that are upset at, at what they're doing. And so they oftentimes, I think, probably would, could, could send in spies or just self-appointed spies. Or someone is just curious and wants to continue the debate, continue the conversation in Paul's absence. Oh, that rabbi's gone. Let's go in there and really upset the apple cart of that with those Gentiles. And so they were their circumcision. Um, and some of them, no doubt, were sent there by Satan, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert or overturn whole households. Now, this is my opinion. This could refer to a family, but also could refer to a house church. Destroy a whole little congregation. Good things so stirred up. Then. Yeah, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. There's the filthy lucre again. We have this happening even in our day. People creeping into houses through the television screen, selling a new anointing times 10 for $2,500. Hey, something about the number 85. If you just send me $85, your whole, you know, your whole life will be changed. The favorite and, number uh, is $1,000. Yeah, send an offering and a copy of your mortgage, and we'll burn the copy of the mortgage in your house. It'll be paid off in record time. Just tricking folks. Uh, one of them, a prophet of their own, said, listen to the prejudice in this statement, Cretans are always liars and beasts, lazy gluttons. What kind of statement is that? That's, that's prejudice. That's um, going to sow division in a congregation that's multicultural. 
This is increased. Always. L listen to the word always. Anytime you say something about a people group, always. Yeah. Sweeping generalization. Uh, yeah. Everybody. Yeah. This is Big broad yeah. brush. <laughs> they all and, and, and Paul's next statement has caused people to debate for centuries. This testimony is true. So some people have said, yes, he agreed with it. The Cretans are liars, and that's why, Titus, you got to get on the stick. He has a reason for saying that. Quoted that what he just said, liars, evil beasts, legend. It's quoted from the Cretan poet, Epimendine, who exaggerated for effect, who, co who coined the phrase, to Cretanize was to lie. It was from an inside source that no. that he took it as the truth, because I've got it. it one of theirs called his own. Life. Right, right. So I'm going to teach both views, and you guys can make up your mind. So one view is one of their own said that they were crazy. <coughs> All right, that's why, brother, you got to bring the truth and not back down, because these people have problems. All right, you believe that? Fine. Not going to break fellowship with you. In my mind, he's talking about Judaizers coming into houses, teaching things they shouldn't for the sake of dishonest gain. And he says, one of them, one of them, who's one of them? Those are the circumcision referred to in verse 10, the troublemakers. One of them, a prophet of their own, said, and he quotes this Christian poet. And says, yep, see what he said, it's right. This testimony is true. It is true, I think, that Paul is agreeing with the fact that someone has said this. All right? And therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Because saying something like that is not Christ-like. Now, whichever you believe, it's fine with me. But I, I really think I'm standing on pretty good ground here within the context that insubordinate, idle talkers, deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. And in verse 14 it says, not giving heed to Jewish fables. The yes. Jesus was, was saying that. Yes. Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. Uh, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for making the word of God of no effect by their tradition. And the Talmudic writings that rabbis have today is a collection of volumes about five feet thick. And these things are really complex. You have to go to college to understand how they're written. You've got the text. You've got the explanation of the text. You've got the word studies from the text. And you've got the oral tradition related to the text, so you got the laws added to the laws, and then you got stories or fables illustrating the text. And some of those things absolutely, completely reverse what the scriptures say. What the, what, what the old scripture says. Right, what the, the original, original scriptures, yeah, the, the Old Testament said. Mm -hmm. So, Based on the con context before and after that statement of Cretans being liars, I think his statement, this testimony is true, is not because he's agreeing with the fact they're being liars. Right. It's and that a, a Jew saying it. Yeah, and I did a little... circumcised one is spreading this. Yeah, and I did a little research, and Crete is the most prosperous of the 13 Greek provinces. And while they have tourism as well, they're so prosperous they don't have to have tourism. So they're hard-working people. Are they, are now, they're they hard-working are... because of that poem or hard-working because of this verse. They're going to show them wrong. Mm -hmm. Laziness is passed down from generation to generation. People learn it from their forefathers. So who broke the curse? Did, they, did Titus do such a good job they stopped being lazy? I mean, you can preach this thing from both sides, but I think the Spirit of Christ lines up more closely with my view. So what do you guys think? <laughs> um, it is very interesting, though. <laughs> well, Paul wrote it. Yeah. Yeah, I think the thing, if you look at the context of Titus, Titus is always talking about sound doctrine. Yeah. He's always talking about being sound in the faith. 
In chapter 2, he even talks about soundness in speech, which is beyond reproach. So the, the thing that Paul is trying to say here is that when there are those people who are supposedly of the faith, who are speaking these kinds of things, we need to we need to rebuke them, right? Because they have to be they have to be sound in the faith. Being sound, that's why when he started the leadership uh, examples, all these leadership examples were these men were this way because they were all sound in the faith, right? They were all had sound doctrine that built these characteristics in their lives. So Paul's going back, and I agree with you. He's, he's saying that it's a, te- it's a true testimony. But these guys are, are lying and they need to be reviewed. They can't remain, because if they're allowed to be remaining in the congregation or in the house or whatever, it, it's going to infiltrate other people and it's going to cause yeah. disruption. Yeah. Um, and I think if they're doing this stuff publicly, they have to be reviewed publicly. If they're seeking to deceive publicly or spreading their prejudice publicly, they've got to be rebuked publicly. Uh, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and the commandments of men who turn from the truth. So the goal isn't just to shame them, but the goal is to bring them to repentance. (coughs) Verse 15, I think, also uh, underlines my view. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. So if we have a pure heart, we're going to view our fellow man with a pure perspective. But if I've got darkness in my heart, I'm going to be suspicious of... of, I'm going to be suspicious of people. I'm going to be suspicious of people either based on their ethnicity or their denomination or whatever. I'm just going to have this suspicion that's going to filter what I see. You remember what Jesus said? The lamp of the body is the eye. If your eye is good, your body will be filled with light. If your eye is bad, your body will be filled with darkness. Be careful that the light in you is not darkness, which to me means we could be filled with darkness and think we're filled with light because everything we see convinces us that Cretans are lazy or whatever it would be. And the problem isn't in the Cretans, it's in, it's in our eyes. I feel like I'm beating it to death. I think you guys get it. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and their conscience are defiled. I had a grandmother who played guitar on the stage of her husband's churches wherever he passed her. Eat up with prejudice. Total racist. Your grandmother? My grandmother. Pastor's wife. (laughs) She's going to have to stand before God, and maybe he'll cut her some slack for being retarded if she was. Did he keep a pure white church? (laughs) Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he makes people in the church. She was old school, and a lot of our forefathers were old school. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, was he an itinerant? Did he have his own church? Uh, They would often be itinerant because of her, they'd have to leave. (laughs) So there was more more going on than just racial prejudice. She had had other things happening, Uh, quick to accuse people of doing something wrong, you know. Um, And listen to this, verse 16. They profess to know God. But in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. So these are not the kind of people to be elders. They're disqualified. They may have a a teaching gift that won't quit. They They may be able to persuade people and lead people astray, but they're not to be leaders of the church because they're not pure something wrong and so Titus has to be on guard I mean a lot has been put on his plate Uh, go with me to Matthew chapter 7 I think it's verse 22 622 is the passage about the lamp of the body 
721, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You who make a lifestyle of rebellion. So I don't think this speaks of a person that's messed up and they've repented. This person is not repenting. And they're continuing to minister. This happens. I think we'll stop right there. We've looked at elders' qualifications and uh, the relationship between the word elder and the word bishop or overseer and, and mature leader. And then we've seen the challenge before him with these troublemakers that are rampant on this island doing stuff. And I think following Paul's style of ministry, Titus no doubt had a team too, because Paul had a team everywhere he went. So Titus wasn't doing this by himself. He had, had some people helping him, I believe.